So everyone, if you have not met her, the wonderful Miss Rebecca Eigsicker. Eigsicker. Eigsicker, there you go. That one. There you go. Second, third, fourth time's a charm with a last name like Echo Camp, you know. Yes. I can relate. So, <laughs> she is going to be doing a presentation on the changing face of dairy marketing. And we are very grateful for our partnership with the Dairy Alliance. They do a lot of stuff with us at the University of Tennessee from farmer relations to 4-H support and promotion. So we, we really appreciate them and we are looking forward to this presentation. So Rebecca, I'll let you take it away. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Liz. And thank you for inviting us to be part of it today. Um, so the changing face of dairy marketing is a pretty broad um, topic and I probably could talk on it for um, hours, if not days. So I wanted to break it down into three um, kind of buckets to help um, just navigate the conversation. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about the consumer landscape and what that looks like today, sort of pre and post COVID, um, what trends in dairy are now and looking to the future, and then how do um, farmers in the dairy community connect with consumers from the farm gates? So um, feel free to put questions into the Q&A um, and Liz will um, send them my way. And my contact information will be at the end too in case anybody wants to shoot me an email, text, or a phone call. So um, we all know that uh, 2020 pretty much changed everything. Um, how we live, how we eat, how we work, how we shop. And depending on what state you're in and what part of the country you live in, um, pretty much doing that from home now, um, consumers are anyway between virtual school, um, virtual work environments, uh, 2020 definitely really changed how we, um, how we function in society, to be honest. So what does that mean for um, our social platforms and how we shop and how we get our products? Um, I'm sure you all have heard about e-commerce and its uh, tremendous rise, uh, particularly through the quarantine. So we saw, um, a huge increase in grocery shopping. Um, those metrics you can see here just outside of COVID um, and quarantine, we had 183% growth online food sales. Um, people were downloading the e-commerce app. So these are things like Instacart um, that Kroger uses and Publix uses, Amazon Fresh, um, the Walmart app, all of those sort of click and collect um, type apps, or some of them that actually do delivery um, straight to your door, drop off type things. And what's really interesting is we're learning that uh, for 37 to about 43% of consumers say they are actually likely to stick with that digital e-commerce um, moving forward. So uh, I think people saw not only the convenience factor of it, I mean, what's better than to sit down with your mobile device, pick your groceries out, put them in a shopping cart, purchase it, drive up to the, um, the grocery store based on the time it tells you to be there, pop your trunk, somebody puts your groceries in there and boom, you're done. So people got really used to that convenience factor, but they also learned that uh, the groceries, particularly milk and other dairy products were fresh and um, they were very pleased with the results from purchasing them through those apps. So we um, at the Dairy Alliance wanted to um, of course, jump on that trend and we partnered with um, a mobile app and um, e-commerce had a, we had a recipe there that people could go in. You can see that's just a little screenshot over there of it. These were sort of a homebound, homemade uh, mini chocolate pies. I developed the recipe. We put a video together um, right here at my house, actually put together sort of a makeshift um, studio and this would show up on their um, on their cart and they could automatically just click it and put all the ingredients and you can see there that the default beverage was a gallon of whole milk. So really happy with the success of this campaign that we did. Um, we ran it for two months and we will definitely uh, keep with that in 2021 based off of the statistics and research that show us that e-commerce is not going away. So um, specifically speaking to dairy sales in the e-commerce sphere, you can see here, um, this is a chart of where we were last year versus this year. And these numbers are through September 27th of 2020. And what's really interesting is if you look at the middle, the rust color chart, the refrigerated dairy milk, and that's obviously fluid milk, all different, the entire category. 
you can see in the beginning of the year in January, um, sales on e-commerce, and this is just um, numbers based off of e-commerce platforms, were right there hovering under 50%. Then of course, with quarantine, that skyrockets, um, almost reaching 200%. And the interesting thing here is, is that level off. You don't really see it dipping back down to sort of the pre-COVID numbers there. So what that tells us is people were pleased with the products that they were getting through their um, Instacart and other e-commerce apps. And they do continue and will, will continue actually to purchase their dairy products through that. Same can pretty much be said with cheese. Um, this had, they had a higher percentage to start with there, um, and but they too have not seen a big tapering off. So um, particularly as people look at putting together, you know, getting together for the holidays or in small groups or that, or sending presents to people, um, cheese uh, had a tremendous amount of sales during the COVID, especially during the spikes. So um, what that really means for us when you look at um, social media, you know, it, it is here to stay and it is very, very powerful. Um, with uh, COVID and quarantine, the average internet usage a day was 4.5 billion people were on the internet, which really shouldn't come as a surprise when you look at the virtual schooling and the work from home um, that was implemented. But what's interesting is the social media statistics, um, and I have a slide after this that shows what the projections were at the end of last year compared to what they really ended up being um, as far as growth goes. But this just is a quick snapshot to show you where consumers are um, on their social media platforms. Facebook, to no surprise, is hovering right about 2.5 plus billion monthly average users. So these numbers are, are what we um, are active users that get onto the platform on a monthly basis. So there are a lot more registered users, but these are just the active ones. Um, and then you look at YouTube and you're looking right around to a little over 2 billion monthly active users. What was interesting was to see the WhatsApp. Um, that saw tremendous growth, particularly during quarantine because um, people were unable to be together, but they really missed that human connection and they wanted to reach out to their friends that they left behind when they had to leave college. Um, visits to grandma and grandpa, you know, were, were prohibited and, and they were unable to do that. So everybody pretty much turned to some sort of a social media platform to connect with those loved ones and family and friends. And the reality is that's not going to go away. Um, the people will, will continue to, to use those. Um, I think there was a, a comfort level, um, and particularly with YouTube, what was interesting with that platform is people really turned to that, as they have in the past, for a lot of the how-to videos. Um, they were at home and looking for things to do and trying some new things. Um, I'm sure you saw um, statistics and articles about home improvement. Um, I think Home Depot and Lowe's um, had massive surges in their lumber. Um, it was virtually hard to find because everybody was home and was deciding to get on YouTube and figure out how to replace those broken deck boards that they had been uh, waiting to do. So um, certainly a trend that we will stay on top of and is very beneficial for the dairy community. So Rebecca, um, I neglected to introduce what the Dairy Alliance is and what you do. And we oh. have a question about that in the chat. I'm just so used to working with you. I assume everyone knows who you are and how wonderful you are. So could you introduce Dairy Alliance sure. and tell us a little bit about you? Sure, absolutely. No worries. Um, so the Dairy Alliance is a nonprofit and we are funded by dairy farmers. Um, I, I probably should have in hindsight, I'm used to people knowing who we are, um, put a little map up there, but um, we work on behalf of the dairy farmer families of the Southeast. We cover eight states, um, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Um, and really what we do, we are a, a marketing promotion and educational arm. Um, so dairy farmers funded us as part of the overall checkoff to um, drive uh, consumer demand and um, sales through our marketing and education and promotion um, tactics of, of dairy foods. We focus, of course, primarily on fluid milk here in the Southeast as far as um, the messaging and the marketing that we do. Is that good, Liz? Cover Okay, awesome, alrighty. Um, so moving on, social media, as I said before, I wanted to show you guys 
sort of the snapshot of what we saw before and what was projected. Um, so the pink there is what was projected at the end of 2020. Um, Instagram was expected to see about a one and a half percent growth. Clearly it saw far more than that. Snapchat was up. Um, also, and Facebook was actually projected to see a little bit of a decrease of um, their monthly average users, but instead they saw um, an increase, not quite as much as Instagram, but um, with some of the plugins that they put, I think people um, wanted to leverage. They had group um, messaging and you could do group videos and, and host sort of online um, group, you know, parties, you could have breakfast with, you know, a friend across the country. Um, so those numbers increase there with Facebook. Um, so talking a little bit, as I said, about some trends in dairy, um, that was pretty much the consumer landscape. And now I would like to um, go over some of what we're seeing trends that happened um, came out of COVID and we expect those trends to continue into um, next year and moving forward. So um, snacking really is, um, is, is a big uh, driver from consumers. I like to say it's taking center stage. They're looking for convenient, healthy, on-the-go options, but with gourmet flavor pairings. So not necessarily your um, typical string cheese or, or cheese um, stick that you might usually find. Um, they're looking for maybe something that is all-inclusive. It has your gourmet cheese. It might have some nuts and some fruit, um, maybe even some salami or something, kind of a grab-and-go um, charcuterie board, if you will. Um, we've seen a lot of growth from some of the cheese manufacturers and they are certainly tapping into that trend. Um, something that I think is really important and the dairy farmers um, do extremely well is um, share their story. There's always room for more, of course, but consumers want to know, they want to put a face with that food. They want to know where it's coming from. And um, this is a great opportunity for dairy farmers to get out there and to show consumers um, the, the nutritious products that they make, how you take care of your cows, um, et cetera. So doing something like this, um, the, the image I have there is actually from a grocery store in Washington, but it's just a cooler flag and it's very simple, just local. It has a picture of the dairy farm family on it. They're holding their product um, and it's just a nice flag in, in the grocery store. Ingle Supermarket does a good job of this as well of really connecting um, their consumers to uh, who is um, providing the milk that they're purchasing, even from their private label. Um, and then, of course, the good for me, good for the planet mentality um, really saw a bit of a spike in this. I think with um, COVID, people are looking for ways to feel like they're doing something good. Um, they can't maybe get out there and do some of the volunteering that they wanted to do. So what are other ways um, in consuming foods that they feel are also good for them or also good for the planet is one way. Um, and you know, a simple thing that we did last year was worked with um, the Harrison family at Sweetwater Valley and did a documentary about um, the sustainability practices and that on the modern dairy farm. Um, so there are a lot of ways that dairy can play in that good for me and good for you. Um, sphere. And it, it is, like I said, it's a great opportunity. And I think that we can um, sort of seize that moment and get more of that messaging out there to consumers. So um, one thing that is kind of important to note is how are consumers really getting their milk. Um, and you can see here the sort of change um, from back in the 1950s to this is, you know, almost um, going on four years ago now, but where people used to really get it um, and, and drink those three glasses or more of milk at mealtimes, especially um, due to shifts um, in how we eat our food, um, being out, you know, at least prior to COVID, out and on the go. Um, you see that intersection there back in the, the mid um, 90s of where sort of the shifted to cheese was really how people are um, consuming their dairy. So fluid milk is still very important and people are using it more and more as an ingredient. And I've got some examples of that um, here in the presentation as well. But I just thought it was important to show um, that intersection and how we're starting to see the shift of consumers really eating their milk versus um, drinking it today. Um, so, as I mentioned, there were some interesting things that came out of COVID as far as food trends go. 
um, particularly during quarantine. So I don't know if um, these resonate with any of you, but uh, maybe you saw some of them and we as an organization certainly jumped on the uh, whipped coffee trend and uh, put out our own version and our own uh, recipe video for it. But what's amazing is something that's been around for a long time, really saw um, tremendous gain. Videos with the whipped coffee increased, um, or they were about 1.5 billion views in a very short amount of time. And then people saw that and said, hey, what can I do differently? Um, how can I you know, make this my own? And we saw a surge in whipped milk. Um, so basically, for those who don't know, the Dagana coffee is you take um, instant coffee and two tablespoons of that, two tablespoons of hot water, two tablespoons of sugar, and you whip it up with a hand mixer, and then you can either put it into a warm glass of milk or a cold glass of milk, depending on um, your preference. So people jumped on this trend and started making their own unique flavor profiles. It was all over the media. It made it onto news networks. Um, Time even talked about it in their publications and online. So, um, and we're starting to see some grocery stores that are, um, I mean, uh, retailers and food service as they start to reopen, they're actually putting this onto menu items as well. Um, additionally, we saw, um, these five um, topics below here, we call it functional foods. Um, those are, you know, foods that do something for the body. People want to know, what is this food going to do for me? And I have some examples of that um, a little bit later. Additionally, they, people were at home. Home cooking um, was, uh, I mean, that, that was what people did. You really didn't have a lot of other options outside of, you know, virtual school or virtual work. Um, people were turning online to find recipes, um, recipe sharing, um, that had the, the biggest pool of conversations on the social media platforms. Um, you know, they were pulling out their, you know, grandma or great grandma's favorite, you know, um, bread recipe and making that, um, cookies, that sort of thing. Additionally, um, quick serve. So these would be things like uh, Starbucks, um, Chick-fil-A, other restaurants like that. We call dupes or, or duplications. People um, couldn't get to those restaurants. If they've you know closed down or they just weren't um, able to get out and, and go to them and they weren't delivering so um, people took online and started making their own versions of the recipes, particularly a lot of the beverages from Starbucks. Um, those sort of um, were were manipulating the conversation there on uh, on social media. Additionally, immunity, you know, that's a big topic um, out of COVID and we won't see that slowing down at all. So. Um, kind of part of that food, what's in it for me, it's the, you know, what, what is this going to do if I drink this, am I going to feel better? Um, we saw a lot of uh, posts and things on media about vitamin D and its potential. It's uh, not an FDA approved message, but, um, you know, what, what does that do for the body as far as immunity and, and um, how it plays a role with COVID? So um, more to come on that, I'm sure, and a conversation that won't go away in 2021. Um, and of course, you know, I love comfort foods any time of year, it doesn't matter. But um, with people being home and kind of feeling uh, a little helpless, um, people turn to the comfort foods. Again, going back to, um, you know, age old family recipes, mac and cheese with, you know, tons of heavy cream and whole milk and, uh, you know, cup after cup of real cheese. Um, the mac and cheese was one of the top rated um, recipes that was shared on social media. Also, um, there was sort of a competition with grilled cheese. You can make the most insane um, grilled cheese. You saw a lot of those recipes being posted in videos as well. So I think people, as much as they might want to say, you know, get on that January trend of um, diet in the new year, uh, a lot of studies and statistics and research show us that people are going to really stick with this whole idea of comfort foods because clearly COVID is, is still here. Um, and so it's something that makes them feel good um, on the inside anyway. So um, taking advantage of some um, trends, some consumer trends, there have been more innovation launches just over the last um, couple years compared to previous years. And these um, products, some of you might have seen already, these are actually in market. Um, I'll just touch lightly on a couple of them. Um, you can see here, this is the kind of high protein, health conscious um, minded individual that might go to these. Um, they're similar to the original Fair Life product. You've got Dairy Gold and Organic Valley, both with their um, high protein, low sugar, high calcium um, options. 
Then they have child-focused nutrition ones. Um, the Borden's Kid Builder's been out for a little while. Um, and then Horizon actually just launched a little uh, earlier this year, they're growing years. And those child-focused nutrition, they have you know, the DHA, the omega-3, the prebiotics that um, young kids need. And these are whole milk, um, which is recommended by pediatricians for ages one to, to five. Um, so definitely geared towards little kids. That's you know, cute packaging. So maybe um, you know, going through the grocery store with a child in your cart, kid might see this and you know, definitely gravitate toward it. And then on the other side of that he um, health conscious, um, health minded person, you have of course the indulgent flavors and the, the full fat options. Um, some of you might've tried these um, the Prairie Farms one, I um, think my favorite is the chocolate peanut butter. Um, it tastes awesome. Then, of course, Kroger launched their private selection label um, of uh, that's a salted caramel and also um, their Dutch chocolate. They really can't keep those on the shelves. And there are lots of other options and examples to show here. I know Target, their private label um, around this time, they always launch their sugar cookie, um, which is a whole milk sugar cookie flavored and inspired um, uh, fluid milk. So um, couldn't get them all on here, but there are a ton out there. And I think it's just awesome to see um, the innovation that's coming from some of the large processors. Um, one of a small on-farm processor, you might recognize a the bottle there is Homeland Creamery based out of Virginia. And that is actually, it's, it's not a screen error. That milk is actually yellow. Um, it's what they call golden milk, um, which has been a big trend um, among health um, conscious individuals. It is turmeric milk. Um, and it's supposed to help with um, antioxidants and inflammation um, and have a little bit of stress and, and, and relaxation to it. So keeping with that what's in it for me mentality, um, consumers, you know, would pick that up and, and it comes already mixed. A lot of those options are just in a powdered format. Um, so this is a great grab and go um, option for consumers. So it sort of checks a lot of boxes there. Um, so these were just a couple of the fluid milk innovations, but I want to touch a little bit on some other product innovations um, that really talk to those nutrition solutions and also the ready-made recipe um, ingredients. As I mentioned, before people are getting their dairy, um, primarily fluid milk through uh, as an ingredient in recipes. And some of the ways that uh, processors have seen um, a way to, to tap into that market is through something like Kemp's or cottage cheese. It's a garlic Parmesan flavored cottage cheese, um, which would be perfect to add to your mac and cheese, some milk in there and a lot of cheese. And there you go, you've already got a great uh, flavor profile. You can see um, there that bold one is a grab and go. It's got 25 grams of protein. So in addition to having a really unique flavor profile with the bacon and cheese, it also is super high in protein. I don't know about you, but that would make an awesome dip. I need to get my hands on it. I imagine that with some sour cream or some cream cheese, some extra bacon, some more cheese, um, and pop that in the oven um, and have a delicious dip. Um, so uh, also you can see getting on the diet um, and, and featuring those um, very popular diet trends like keto, that's um, a product there, the ratio from General Mills. Um, obviously, they're, they're talking to those people who want to have um, a fuller fat, but a lower sugar um, option. And then, you know, Chobani is always um, good and ahead on some of their um, nutrition solutions, and they've got calling out on all of their packaging very clearly that this is no lactose and that it's easy to digest. Um, and this is their complete line that has um, added protein in it as well. And these are two and percent and full fat um, dairy in there. And then of course you have um, from DFA, they have their sport shake and it calls out right there, of course, that it's real dairy um, and it's a high protein shake and it's geared towards athletes as a recovery beverage. And then Trader Joe's is always known for launching a new line of um, something for the, the holiday season and um, they've got their eggnog inspired protein beverage smoothie. So, and it is with um, real dairy milk is in that one. So um, the value added market, as I said, has seen tremendous growth in just in the last three years, it has grown 20%. Um, and that's across the board. That isn't necessarily just fluid milk. That's all of the value added. 
um, categories, the different flavors, um, the, the high protein, low sugar, that kind of thing. Um, and some of them have even gone so far as to make it into a meal and, and do a meal replacement by adding grains and fruit. Um, I know that Fair Life has their meal replacement version that is blended with um, real milk, oat powder, and some fruit flavorings in there. And it is a high protein um, shake. And it's actually, um, I think they have both a shelf stable and a refrigerated option. And they are meant to grab and go and replace a meal with that. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about how, what this impact, all these consumer trends and um, innovations, what this really means to um, dairy farmers and how you all can continue to connect with consumers um, despite um, not maybe them being able to come out to the farm, um, some ways to engage with them. So um, it is a great opportunity to engage with consumers one-on-one. -on -one. We have shown um, through surveys, pre and post, any sort of farm tour or farm outing that we've done or a virtual tour that um, it really has changed the perception of um, the attendees and the visitors as to what they think about dairy farms and consuming milk. We have many testimonials that, you know, say I, I really wasn't, you know, sure and I, I wasn't drinking much milk, but now that I've met you and I've been to your farm and I see it, and, and this doesn't have to be for, you know, a microprocessor, somebody who's doing it on farm. This same goes for somebody who's shipping to Kroger, or to Mayfield, to Ingalls. Um, you can tell them, you know, my, my milk goes here, go over there and, and pick up a gallon of it. Um, because consumers really do want to know where their milk is coming from and who's the face behind the product that's being produced. So it's educational for them, um, but it's also very helpful and beneficial for dairy farmers as well. Um, of course, hosting on farm tours is um, there's a lot that goes into those. They're not meant for everybody. And particularly as we've seen those social media numbers um, skyrocket, it's uh, also a perfect opportunity for dairy farmers to get on there. So there are opportunities like a virtual farm tour, which we've hosted a couple of those and um, certainly would be happy to help anyone who's interested in doing that. Um, or just, you know, getting on social media. If you don't have a social media presence, even if you aren't selling a private label product from your farm, um, sharing your story on social media is still a great way to um, let the public know the value of milk in the diet, what you all do on a daily basis, how you take care of your cows, the sustainability efforts that you all put into your farm. I would like to say you guys are, are you know, the original environmentalists and um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there and hearing directly from you all um, and, and busting those myths, you really, you really can't beat that. Um, so if you are interested, if you don't have a social media for your farm, um, now that's something that you might want to consider myself or um, Denise um, Jones, I'm sure you all know, is the farmer relations manager for Tennessee. Um, she is also, um, she's on this call, she's also able to help out and uh, make sure you guys get content and get your social media going there. Um, other resources, of course, are available. Um, and the process can really be customized to anyone. I've got some examples of some of the things that we've done um, from virtual farm tours, like I said, to on-farm signage um, or marketing. And um, they can be, you know, customized to fit whatever level you might need. Or maybe if, you know, having um, opening up your farm gates is not something you want, um, but you want to get your story out there, do storytelling, visual storytelling through videos um, is one of the number one ways that people are getting their information. Um, videos through social media um, platforms have surged um, and they can be anything from short snippets to long documentaries like we've done before. So um, just a, you know, a little bit of encouragement and I know it can be scary um, and, and maybe daunting, but certainly um, there are a lot of resources out there and um, uh, my, me, myself, our staff and other people, um, we work with Department of Ags all the time to, um, and even if you have, let's say robots or something like that that you put in, we can work with different vendors um, that are on your farm to also um, get them involved and help um, with the signage and, and the cost of those and the um, video production as well. So um, these are just a few examples. Um, this is Hillcrest Dairy Farm um, in Georgia and they have, um, put in robotic milkers from De La Valve. Um, we partner with them as well. And uh, they have a small viewing room, um, but we uh, wanted to capitalize on the space there and they wanted to open up to the public. 
So we put up signs for them. You can see there the amazing cow. It's a little bit of an, you might have seen that sign before, an adaptation for one that we did for the Harrisons at Sweetwater Valley. Um, all of this is customizable to your content. Um, and they have seen, you know, they really opened up kind of in the um, right when COVID hit. Um, but people want to get out. They particularly want to get out into nature and far away from other people. And really, dairy farms can be a good place to socially distance. Um, so the consumers get out there, book a small tour, and, and go take a tour of it. Um, it's an outing, especially for um, virtual uh, classrooms and homeschoolers as well. Uh, additionally, we did a virtual farm tour with Riley Mason there from Harmony Way um, Dairy in Tennessee. And um, pretty un unsophisticated, if you can tell, that's um, just a couple staff people were there. Um, we have a camera, it's a used, uh, an iPhone is used for it with a little gadget that holds it stable, um, have internet connection, and he basically walked around, um, maybe some of you all saw it um, online, walked around and gave a, an in-depth look at um, the dairy farm and then answered some questions. And we've had um, about 15,000 um, views of that particular virtual farm tour and saw a lot of success. So we plan to do many more. And certainly if anybody is interested um, in hosting one themselves, um, we would be happy to work with you on that. Uh, also, you can see this is Mountain Fresh Creamery. Um, they wanted to open up their farm gates, um, primarily to a younger audience, to school age kids, and they built a facility as well. So you can see some of those graphics there. Um, that talk about the dairy breeds. Um, the other side is the, um, the milking parlor viewing room there. So um, again, this is just a way to, you know, visually share your story, do more of that um, storytelling through on-farm signage or videos to um, market uh, dairy foods to consumers. That is pretty much my presentation. Um, open it up for Q&A now. Um, Liz, if there's anybody um, on there that has questions. Well, so far the Q&A has been pretty quiet, but okay. attendees, please start filling in the Q&A. Um, Denise did throw her contact information there. So okay. for any of our Tennessee or Kentucky farmers, if you do not know Denise, you should know Denise because Denise is also amazing. Um, and these guys cannot say enough good things about everything that they do across all the facets of dairy um, and particularly with UT and their involvement here they're huge supporters of a lot of our 4-H programs so they get out the good word about dairy here through our June dairy chairperson which is coming up next June <laughs> we are getting ready for that already mm -hmm. and that allows students from or 4-Hers from every single county in Tennessee to get out there and talk about dairy and share their dairy story. And we've had kids that are talking about cow dairies. We've had kids that are talking about goat dairies. I don't think we've had any talk about a sheep dairy yet. Not that I remember anyway. Rebecca and Denise might have better members than me on that one. But we have had a lot of students talk about many different facets of the dairy industry. And one of the things that the Dairy Alliance has always encouraged is that those students go out and meet with a farmer in their area and help share that farm story. So that's another really good way to connect with your local 4-H'ers and to help share your farm story is, is through that. And we'll be pushing that out loudly and announcing a lot as we get closer to June. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's one thing for, for me or Denise, um, I mean, of course she lives on a dairy farm and um, so obviously her message goes farther, but you know, the, the public doesn't want to hear, consumers don't want to hear from me um, they want to hear from the dairy farmers, and um, it really is um, fascinating and a, a great way and a tool for them to share their story, whether, again, that's just on, online, through a video, through a tour. There, there are so many options, um, but I would, it can, like I said, can be daunting, but I would encourage them um, to reach out so that uh, they can get their story out there. So I actually logged in for part of that Harmony Way tour, and that was so much fun particularly reading through the chats and seeing all the comments from the kids about well what do cows eat you didn't answer my question there was just there were two or three kids just kept sending their questions again through the chat being like wait you didn't answer my question wait you didn't answer my question so i know something that we've heard from farmers in the past is concern with opening the farm gates and having 
the negative side of that coming at them. So what would you say to not necessarily assuage fears, but, but talk around that and the, the benefits outweighing some of the risks? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the benefits absolutely outweigh the risks. No, no question. So um, it's not something that you, um, you know, have to go alone at. There are resources available. Um, you know, we have booklets, guidebooks, um, we have some webinars and that that they can um, use to get information. Um, you know, it's, uh, and like Riley, he was, that was the first time he'd ever done anything virtual like that. Now he had um, done some actual live tours on the farm before, um, but that definitely is a little bit different than doing it virtually because you're just walking and, and talking instead of having that, you know, interaction with people on the farm. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it really doesn't take that much. Um, it, it, people, I think, feel like they have to have it be this, you know, this showcase or this quintessential, you know, dairy farm, this image that people might have. But what really works the best is showing um, a real, true working dairy farm, because um, then it kind of debunks a little bit of that false narrative that I think consumers um, envision or what they might have seen, you know, someplace um, online or in a movie or something like that. So, um, you know, really, we haven't had a lot of, um, once people have opened up for, you know, tours or even on social media, um, there have been very few instances where they've been attacked by animal activists. And I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns um, that they probably have that I would have, of course, you know, if I were in their shoes as well. Um, but, you know, they don't have, I think people are genuinely appreciative of the uh, information and that their willingness to be transparent. Um, and, and again, we do have resources um, on staff that can, you know, help with any issues that might arise. Um, so if they're somebody's interested and they want to just kind of, you know, dip their toes in it. Social media is a great way. Starting a website is a great way. Um, and then, of course, if they are, want to go, you know, full throttle and, and open up and start doing tours, um, you know, that certainly is, um, is another vehicle um, that they can use. So does that help a little bit? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. A lot of our audience today is small scale processors or people who are thinking about starting a small scale processing mm -hmm. and they may not have gone too far down the how am I going to market my product route. I know that was a big focus of kind of the middle of your presentation. What would be the top thing you would tell them to look at as far as either trying to get marketing or identify a potential market? What's the number one thing you would want them to do first? Research. Research. Yeah, and we can help with that too. We have we have in-house research teams, so we can help them um, research uh, for sure. Um, you know, you, you got to look at what is your your a product differentiator, right? So, what's going to set you apart? Um, what do you have to to give to consumers um, that might be different? You know, and it and first and foremost, what's different is it's local. It's produced on this farm. There's a you know family story behind it. I mean, that's obviously, uh, you know, first, and but it's common, right? So when you look at other on-farm processors, um, they all have that. I mean, that's what, that's what they all do. So now what is, what is going to differentiate? Are you going to be non-homogenized? Are you going to offer some sort of, you know, flavor profile that's unique? Um, is there something, you know, your location? Um, how are you going to get this product in the hands of consumers? Um, so once you sort of establish that you want to move forward with it, I would definitely, you know, look at um, a market analysis to see where it's been, you know, where is it saturated versus not saturated. Um, that might tell you the kind of product that you need to develop, um, but getting it to people, you know, it, do you have a farm side, you know, a stand, a roadside stand, you know, obviously hatchers, you know, they have that. People, you know, drive up to the shop and um, the store and they get their, you know, products there. They go to do the um, farmer's markets and things. However, you know, right now, a lot of those farmers markets or, you know, group gatherings where they would probably um, sell their products, you know, might not be happening just depending on what, what state you're in. Um, so I would make sure that you have um, a place to sell it. Talk to retailers before, um, you know, they might tell you and, and give you some insights as to what seems to be moving. Um, but really, you know, product innovation, a, a, a different flavor profile, um, if you can make something like that work, like again, you know, the hatchers, they have their jittery 
I think is what it is there, um, caffeinated um, mm -hmm. chocolate milk, which I made the mistake of giving to a six-year-old, which didn't turn out well. Um, so <laughs> I did <laughs> mistake on my end. Um, oh. But, you know, there's like uh, moon milk, um, uh, people heard of that, or the golden milk. Moon milk, you know, is supposed to have, uh, you know, chamomile and, and melatonin in it and, you know, have a warm glass of moon milk and then, you know, a great night's sleep. So um, what, what can you do as an on-farm processor that's going to set you apart from others? Something else that you kind of talked about that you do, but you didn't really super highlight that you do, is that you are also a chef, correct? And you create lots of recipes that I know make my mouth water every time I get an update from the Dairy Alliance. So <laughs> is that something that you think would be a good strategy for some of the small scale processors to do as well, to talk about ways to use their product besides just oh, for sure. drink my milk, eat my cheese? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think if you go and you look at, um, look at some of the ones around the state, you know, I mean, I, I follow them, um, obviously, on social media, and I see, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, I know, I, I mean, even before they opened up their cafe, um, Sweetwater, you know, they were doing, showing videos of um, the cheese curds, and, you know, how to, my, my new favorite way to cook them is just in a, not battered and fried, but just in a skillet, um, it's round, melty cheese goodness, um, you know, so, I, and I know, you know, Hatchers do it and, and others, of course, as well, um, showing their product and how, how can you use this, um, whether it's, you know, their whole buttermilk in biscuits or in ice cream, um, you know, and, and Nash, you know, Family Farm, I know I went and met with them and talked a little bit about some um, interesting products that they might be putting on the market and different flavor profiles and trends and things and, you know, provided them with some insights for milkshake flavors and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, people, um, you know, with their eating with their eyes, so to speak, um, you put out a great picture or a quick video of um, you know one of your products and you're gonna see sales definitely increase for that. Yeah, absolutely. Recipes are a way to people's heart. Mm -hmm. And pictures of the liquid food are the way to my stomach. Yes, yeah. it always makes me hungry. Yes. That marketing strategy by Sweetwater Valley worked out a little bit too well with the cheese curds in our house. Yes. Lux and I killed an entire bag in one sitting and we couldn't move for about five hours. Yeah, we, we did. I bought some when I was there and I, I brought them home and I did a quick little recipe video for work for them. So um, yes, they are, they are quite tasty. Yes, that worked. That works too well, Rebecca. You're doing too good of a job. <laughs> did you say Denise was on here? Yes, she um, is. Yeah, yeah, she is on here. Mm -hmm. Well, while we're um, waiting for her to get on, I will just say that, you know, um, if people are interested and need research of any sort or just kind of want to, you know, get um, some statistics or figure out what, um, what the market demands are or how viable maybe doing some sort of a value add um, option for their farm would be. Um, we, if we don't have that research already in house, we can certainly um, get access to it um, and, and we'd send that, you know, share that with them. So um, my information is at the end of, um, after this slide here. So um, click on it, there you go. Oh, there we go. Um, so people, um, you know, viewers, attendees can reach out to me or Denise. There's her barn picture. There it is. Um, Cause you know, starting with a good marketing plan is probably the, <laughs> the first step in uh, launching some sort of a, a value added um, product there. You're still on mute, Denise. Yeah. <laughs> She's trying real hard. I know. There she goes. There you go. I usually do this from my desktop. Sorry, my apologies. Well, that's Hello, fine. everyone. <laughs> she put you on the spot, Denise. That's I okay. did. I really, really did. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I would like to reiterate uh, be sure to check with your local ag department to see what kind of resources they have for entrepreneurs and for small businesses when it comes to business planning. I think sometimes a lot of people just jump in and say, you know what? I'm going to fix this situation. We're going to start selling our own product, controlling the price from our consumers and, and the products we're selling. But honestly, from the people that we've talked to and worked with, it is a long-term plan, anywhere from two to five years. Once you make that initial, hey, we're going to jump in the water, we're going to make cheese or ice cream or whatever that product is. And I really encourage you to work with some kind of professional to come up with that business plan that long-term plan and how you're gonna implement 
the investments and what it's going to take to be a dairy farmer, a distributor, as well as a processor. So those are just, that's one thing I think people really need to keep in mind. And marketer all rolled into there as well. Yeah. There's lots of resources out there. Mm -hmm. Well, our chat is still being pretty quiet. Any final thoughts, comments, advice? Um, oh, I mean, I would just obviously echo what, uh, what Denise said there for sure. Um, and just, you know, not the, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I suppose. <laughs> um, but you know, there is a great demand for that sort of small, um, you know, I would maybe say, you know, boutique um, kind of offering when it comes to um, dairy products, be it fluid milk, cheese, yogurt, cottage cheese, um, people, they, they want it and they're, they're sort of hungry, no pun intended, for it. Um, so, you know, it, I, I know it probably is scary, but um, as Denise said, and I'm sure Liz has said, there are a lot of resources out there um, for you, even, you know, grants and things um, that Department of Ag in, in various states, not just in Tennessee, but in other states too, because um, I think there were some people maybe from some other states on this um, as well that they would have those opportunities. So, um, and, and reach out, you know, I, I heard some before, I think um, Mr. Cruz was talking about, you know, I think Promised Land coming to their farm. I hear it all the time. Um, there's no better way to get some, some insights, um, but to, you know, go to um, you know, a fellow dairy farm and talk with them, see what they're doing, you know, whether that's putting in, you know, robotics or, you know, some sort of a um, agritourism opportunity or on-farm processing. Um, I, I think anytime I go meet with a farmer and they have one of those initiatives, they all say the same thing. Well, oh yeah, we went and visited with so-and-so before we started. We went to this person's farm. We, we checked out what they did um, because they're already in it um, and they can probably um, give you some, some good insights and put you on a path, maybe learn from not saying they made mistakes, but learn from others' mistakes, but <laughs> maybe some do's and some don'ts um, for sure. So um, those, I guess, would be my, my parting words. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and thank You're you, Denise, for agreeing to, un to show your face on You're the welcome. spot. <laughs> I swore, I promised I wouldn't do that to you anymore, and look here, I did it. But we appreciate your time and your expertise being here with us today. Uh, and my if y'all are okay with it, I'll share your contact information, our follow-up email. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any way we can help. I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Stay yes. safe and healthy. Merry Christmas. Keep sending recipes, Rebecca. I need more things to make over the oh. Christmas holiday. <laughs> oh, sure. I will. I'm going to go make a creamy tortellini soup and, um, after this. <laughs> you always make me hungry. All right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.